I am pleased to have such prominent speakers today uh, because we are doing very important task we want to accomplish uh, because as you might remember uh, the idea of World Academy of Art and Science is to can convert knowledge ideas into actions. So we'll see uh, how presenters will uh, manage this issue and I hope uh, we will uh, leave this session with concrete uh, uh, suggestions, uh, solutions, how to save the world, period. This is a little <laughs> task for us. Okay. Next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, I argue for years that uh, particularly talking with um, NGOs, communities, also in academia, that we should not take adversary approach to business and treat them, you know, as uh, and block. We should build bridges and use the resources because business manage the world's largest resources, not the government. Governments are getting on different taxes. According to Mike Porter, I used to work for the uh, last 15 years, you know, I mean, uh, business controls more or, or less uh, about 70-75% uh, global resources, particularly all those market e economies and sometimes even more. So anyway, how to use the uh, resources in business uh, sector to meet the social and uh, environmental goals, uh, because business is taking economic goals uh, pretty well. I think what uh, uh, we are going to, uh, to respond to these issues, and if we we'll know how to do this, you know, then we will move how to teach uh, this way. And then you will see, besides this first, next uh, slide, please. I've lost everybody picture-wise. I can hear you, but I can't see anybody. Okay. Sashini, could we... Yeah, uh, could we fix the... Sash? Yeah. Uh, okay, you get it? Okay. Yeah, it's me. That's... Uh, Hello, everybody. Okay. Hello, this is Tal Ronin from Tel okay. Aviv. Can you hear me? Okay. Are we on? Fantastic. Yeah, we the, hear uh, you, the, and then we will uh, we will start with your uh, presentation with the country, you know. So then we will be uh, the order I have already mentioned that it was uh, with uh, Stephen, uh, uh, Sash, and uh, Halid. Okay, so let's start. Uh, Tal, the floor is yours. I am very pleased to see. Thank publications you, thank you. and uh, presentation you will present on on behalf of uh, Yehuda. You are working with him. I should say that Yehuda is famous scholar, retired, uh, but still active. Retired, but not tired, as he is telling. Um, yes. He is prominent in uh, the area of uh, theory of um, insurance and risk management. His textbooks are worldwide known. He used to teach not only in Israel, but in the United States and Canada. And he is also an entrepreneur. One of his um, uh, businesses on, uh, is on NASDAQ. And in recent years, he is particularly active in uh, uh, startups. As you know, Israel is the world center of uh, innovative startups. So this, uh, today, uh, we will talk uh, about the new economy and a financial climate for climate finance. And he titled in, in, in uh, Cadmus journal, those of you who read this. And Tal is very well known uh, coach, uh, doing executive coaching for over 25 years. And also, he used to coach prominent politicians, including uh, uh, former, uh, late, uh, unfortunately, uh, Prime Minister Simon Perez. I had the pleasure to talk with him 
and, and even his Polish was pretty good. <laughs> I met him in Warsaw. So yes. anyway, Carl, take the floor. You have 10 minutes and then we will uh, move to the, um, the next presenter to Frank. Okay, go ahead. Fantastic, thank you very much. And I highly appreciated the opportunity to speak on behalf of such a person. You know, we're celebrating the UN 75th anniversary and we just celebrated Yehuda Kahana's 75th anniversary last August. And the, the Yehuda, as you said, is part of the prominent uh, people in Israel that built the culture and was a, so a fundamentally important on the development of the Israeli financial uh, insurance, reinsurance. So, so amongst you, amongst you in the World Academy of Art and Science, as with the many people that we've been listening the last few days, we have a person that actually declares that he finds and he can uh, witness and he can show us how to resolve the biggest challenge of the financial uh, uh, gap of our time is financing the sustainable development goal. And with his background, when I was looking for, to someone around the world who understand what would it take to finance five to seven trillion or four to five, I've heard different figures on the, on, in different talks this week, Yehuda's whole life as the, one of the guys who won the highest award for insurance, you know, he won the, a, a, a long side with being was a, a, was a, a a, a, a treasurer, for what I understand. He also recipient of the, Saint Berkeley, uh, the John Berkeley Insurance Fund of the world for the highest regard in thinking globally. So I'm saying it, not because in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to listen carefully to a verbalization of what he thinks we can do. Everything that we're gonna be saying stands on the fact that Yehuda's model, the one he, wrote about and in his, is now available on your magazine, is this, the model that actually built the financial market of Israel. When Israel was first an issue and they needed a breakthrough innovation for financial climate to, climate, to create the country, Yehuda's model was in, put to test and it worked. It worked and so when you listen to a solution, what I'd like to ask you, please, is to consider the fact that in this moment, when there's a clear emergency, not urgency, emergency and we in danger to human species, amongst us, there must, might be ideas and solutions that are as good as solutions that come from this country for corona, coronavirus. Israel is a great place to alchemy. You know, the, the place when you, we are working on turning air to water and water to food and finding global solution, Yehuda Kahana's work was to answer the question, how can we finance the new economy? His whole life, accidentally, on his 75th birthday, Hebrew date, he, lo he had a stroke. And since then, the last eight months, Yehuda is fighting his way back to be able to bring to bear to our listening and maybe to no less than Tikkun Olam and saving the world a solution that if he is right and I'm his partner, we cannot afford to not to miss it because he proclaims. And if somebody gets a credit to speak about it as a PhD in finance. Actually, the guy knows this thing back and forth. He's one of the world leaders amongst you for risk management. And he tells me, Tal, we have a model. We tested it here in Israel. It's rather complicated to explain. However, it's very doable. It's on the level of nations. And now we need to work with the level of government and please refer it. So imagine me, not an economist, 
but highly committed person to the world and to the future of, of our generation, a partner to you, the Kahana, we both vowed, pledged to make this earth a secure and hospitable home for present and future generation. And in that role, I'm now gonna tell you what Yehuda said. So please listen to it. I'm not gonna go through the backbone of understanding. I'm gonna, he had it written. Every word on the abstract that you have and the letters on his article took him weeks. A guy that was able to speak now needs to write one word, couple of hours. So in that high appreciation and human love that I ask you to listen, because here's what I know. If we hear what Yehuda Kahana's proposal is able to do, I'm 65 years old, I've been around the block, as you heard, and I'm not sure on my years of traveling around the world that we found this vivid solution to that. Yehuda's alchemy, he actually asks us to consider the sustainable development goals as a framework to turn into a currency or learn long-term instrument of financial. And due to the fact that not all the metrics as we de dealt with it here on this thing, two thirds of the metrics are not included in the econo economy, he says we need to structure a model that internalize the externalities and he proposed a model and it's on the side to take the SDGs, turn them into a unified metrics dashboard framework, make it as a financial instrument and build a whole new market, turning the SDGs to a currency that is financing the externalities and makes a long-term impact and long-term investment, 34 based on the SDGs. That's how I am, non-economist understood. That's what they did in Israel and in his, in his lecture, in his written words, he found a way to transform, to transform in a nation level, the currency, the created currency of the metrics that is available throughout the SDGs, make it an economy mark, economic market with a tag to it, and build the structure to finance both the SDGs, all of it, B, the externalities, which are crucial to future generation. And what really excites me is to see his pension plans and a whole future market for the millennials. His models proposes that not only are we gonna save the world financing it, we are also gonna be able to build the market as the one we created in Startup Nation that drove Israel to be in a small place with huge impact. That kind of framework, which he knows how to put, and he can work with you. There's so many great people in this panels and economy, the World Academy of Art and Science, together with your smarts and his ideas, we can actually bring a solution. Jeffrey Sachs talked about it. Gary, everybody is looking. It's not all of the solutions, but it's a doable solution that will transform, and I'm ending with that the SDGs into a future currency for future generation and finance us all into a thrivable world instead of trying to manage small bits of emergency when we need transformation. We need a shift in transformations from organization to nation states. So Yehuda's whole idea in our lab in YK Center was to find, a, to find a model that is scalable, that is fast, past proved, that can be rebooted and readjusted, and common sense that brings the whole ecosystem of planet Earth from an ecosystem to an ecosystem while we are all flourishing and passing it on to future generations. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tal. Uh, I want to uh, add that uh, we saw for a few decades, I observe uh, the financial support for all these United Nations goals from uh, Rio Summit and uh, the commitments of particular countries. It didn't work. Only, I guess, Scandinavian countries uh, move close to 1% of investment, uh, and they, some of them even invested more. But it was a constant problem. So we have a solution here. Uh, we need to uh, discuss, keep in mind. We will have also, I mean, this is interesting uh, uh, point for two next presentations. Uh, but uh, as an environmental economist also, uh, I am so pleased to see the concept, clear concept, uh, how to invest uh, available resources from pension funds in positive externalities, positive social and environmental externality, externalities, which will help us to survive. This is excellent concept. I'm talking about positive externalities because we talk a lot about negative externalities like pollution and so on. So anyway, uh, this is to keep in mind. And um, having said so, uh, I strongly recommend you to read the Cadmus Journal, uh, June issue uh, 2020 uh, with this article. And then we will switch to uh, Frank Dixon, uh, who is the founder of the uh, uh, <clears throat> program uh, Systemic uh, Global System, uh, excuse uh, Global System uh, Change. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, we saved some time uh, on previous uh, presentations. So uh, global system change and the uh, system change investing is his concept he developed, he's applying and he will talk about what is uh, common uh, with the previous uh, uh, presentation, that type of systemic approach. We see the, the whole world. And so Frank, take the floor. You have 10 minutes. Thank, you very, much. <laughs> Thank you very much, the big Go ahead. Um, it's an honor to be participating on this distinguished panel. As you said, I'll be talking about system change investing today. Um, the global leadership in the 21st century program is looking for catalytic strategies for addressing the world's major challenges and SCI or system change investing is one of the most powerful options available to humanity for driving system change and addressing the root causes of those major challenges. It's also a very large opportunity for the corporate and financial sectors. It enables financial institutions to increase assets under management uh, and investment returns while positioning themselves as leaders in the large and rapidly growing sustainable responsible investing market. In my talk, I'll discuss the genesis of SCI, how it works and the financial and societal benefits of the program. For many years, I was the head of research for the largest company in the world, rating corporations on sustainability or ESG performance. Our company was formed in the mid-1990s, Innovest, and we were, we were one of the first, if not the first, to argue that investors could make more money by taking ESG or sustainability issues into account. I developed most of their rating models and uh, research procedures and managed 50 analysts who rated the world's 2,000 largest companies on, su on su sustainability or ESG performance. And we were showing that sustainability leaders were making more money in the stock market. In almost every sector, the leaders outperformed laggards uh, by, uh, by 300 to 3,000 basis points. I saw many examples of companies that were, that were making more money by acting more responsibly, but uh, this was always only true up to a point. Um, be, I estimated that companies could, est to, could mitigate about 20% of their negative impacts in a profitable way. Beyond that point, 
their costs would go up and if they continued, they'd put themselves out of business. So it became clear that our economic and political systems were unintentionally creating a situation where all companies must degrade the environment and society to survive. There are many ways that our systems force companies to degrade the environment and society. But if you were to take all the system flaws and roll them up into one overarching system flaw, it would be the failure to hold companies fully responsible for negative impacts. This is the mechanism in competitive markets that makes it impossible for any company without exception to act in a fully responsible manner and remain in business. There are many specific system flaws that force companies to degrade the environment and society by not holding them responsible. Examples include externalities, limited liability, time value of money, um, focusing on economic growth instead of social well being, and allowing regulated entities to inappropriately influence regulars, regulators. So I estimated that. System change was probably at least 80% of the sustainability solution, but it was getting close to 0% of the attention in, especially in the corporate and financial areas. I also saw as an ESG rating expert that we could use ESG to drive system change in the same way that we that we've been successfully using it for 20 years to engage companies in sustainability. The basic approach is to expand the focus of ESG rating. Uh, out to include corporate system change performance and then help investors to understand why system change is relevant and how they'll make more money by taking it into account. I developed the first model for uh, rating companies on system change in 2003. It was called total corporate responsibility. The approach was before its time then, but I think its time has come now. The World Economic Forum and many other mainstream groups are talking about um, economic reform, capitalism reform, and other types of systemic changes. COVID is showing the fragility of the human economy and our vulnerability to nature. The George Floyd protests and other traumatic events are showing that our systems are actually in the process of changing now. It's inevitable that our flawed economic and political systems that put business in conflict with society and humanity in conflict with nature will uh, change through voluntary or involuntary means. Throughout human history, all flawed systems have changed, usually by collapsing. If we don't figure out how to evolve our systems into sustainable forms, then nature and reality is gonna do it in a traumatic manner. So in terms of sustainability, many governments, companies, NGOs, and other groups have been working on it aggressively and well for over 20 years. These efforts have provided a lot of benefits but they haven't resolved major challenges. And one of the issues with current sustainability programs uh, is that they're mostly focused on trying to change companies instead of the systems that largely control companies. And they're also focused on trying to address symptoms instead of root causes. The flawed economic and political systems that force companies to degrade the environment and society are the root causes of the major challenges addressed by the SDGs. If we don't focus, begin to focus more on root causes, we're not going to be able to achieve the SDGs or sustainability. It's not going to work. Focusing on symptoms but not root causes would be like trying to put out a fire with one hand while throwing gasoline on it with the other. The SCI approach shifts the emphasis uh, or the focus of, SC, of SRI, Sustainable Responsible Investing, and Corporate Sustainability from changing companies and addressing symptoms to changing systems and addressing root causes. We've been working on system change for decades. Uh, it's been provided a lot of benefits, but we haven't, our efforts at economic reform and other system change efforts haven't driven the scale of systemic change needed to resolve major challenges. So new approaches are needed. Uh, basically what we need to do is a whole system approach that looks at all of humanity as, uh, and the economy as part of one system. I wrote a series of books called Global System Change about how to do that. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that SCI is one of the most powerful and catalytic strategies for addressing root causes and resolving major challenges. The reason for that is to evolve our systems into sustainable forms, we'll need actions in all areas of society, the general public, government, and corporate financial. The people collectively are the most powerful force if they work together on their common issues. 
But unfortunately, it's easy to disempower the people mainly by dividing them into vested de debating groups like conservatives and liberals. Government um, in the US and many other countries is largely controlled by vested interests. Uh, so they're unlikely to change on their own unless there's a catastrophe. In this environment of a divided, disempowered public, invested interest controlled government, that leaves the corporate and financial sector as usually the most powerful segments of society. They're largely controlled by investing. So what SCI does is it uses this most powerful lever of investing to engage the most powerful sectors, corporate and financial, in the most important sustainability issue, system change. Um, so that's why it's powerful. Something that makes it more powerful is the fact that it's relatively easy to implement compared to other system change approaches. Changing the economic and political system is extremely complex and difficult. SCI doesn't attempt to do that. Instead, it, it strongly incentivizes companies and investors to work on system change. So it's a form of indirect system change. Also, uh, SCI is easy, e relatively easy to implement because it's based on existing mainstream strategies that almost all large financial institutions are already doing. Most of them offer responsible investing products. SCI is a modification of ESG ratings. Then they use them to develop the same type of funds marketed through the same channels. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what SCI is and how it works, rating companies on system change performance is much more difficult than rating them on ESG because the context or framework is much larger. The framework for ESG rating largely is companies' negative impacts and their efforts to mitigate those, for example, by selling green products. The context or framework for system change analysis ultimately is the whole Earth system uh, with its sub-element human society. Before you can rate companies on system change, you have to understand what system change is overall. Then once you see that, you can identify the optimal corporate role in it, and aspects of that become metrics and system change rating models. In the same way that there's many ways to rate ESG, there are many ways to rate system change. To give a sense of what an SCI model would look like, I'll describe the first model, TCR, the one I developed in 2003, it's divided into three categories of metrics, traditional ESG, mid-level system change, and high-level system change. Mid-level refers to the sector, stakeholder, or environmental social issue level. High-level relates to evolving overarching economic, political, and social systems into sustainable forms. The types of metrics in the model, the things we would measure from corporations include the presence and quality of corporate system change strategies, media campaigns, engagement and collaborative system change efforts, government influence activities, addressing specific system flaws, and uh, groups that are involved okay. in system change. So, well, I was just gonna say the business case and then wrap it up. So in, in terms of to sell the approach, we have to make a strong business case to investors, explain to them why, uh, system change is important and how they can benefit from it. Um, you know, basically, when systems put business in conflict with society, negative impacts come back and hurt the company. So they have a strong incentive to change the systems in ways that'll protect themselves. Also, using system change ratings uh, can enhance financial returns by identifying systemic risks and opportunities and providing, providing a good proxy for management quality. And they also can provide more sustainability benefits because they're focusing on the main sustainability issue of system change. So by, by providing great sustainability and financial benefits, they can track, at, attract new assets under management. In summary, um, G, global, global leadership in the 21st century is looking for catalytic ways to address major challenges. Uh, SCI provides one of the most powerful and catalytic strategies for doing so. Thank okay, you. thank you, Frank. As you could see, uh, Frank uh, was talking about system change. It's similar, different words as uh, 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 Yehuda uh, was talking, because I mean, one of the first ideas in his uh, paper is uh, 
there is no way to solve environmental and social threats with, uh, within the traditional capitalist framework. So we need to make a change. And so now, is it, I mean, this can, is big Avenue, excuse me. Can, well. Excuse me. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I, for, I, I got so I three. I forgot to read Yehuda's paper, and you just mentioned it. I, I, you know, I made the preparation. Let me take another minute. I know I'm out of flame because I want to tell him, tell you what he wrote. He asked me to tell you. Okay. It will take another minute. I'm sorry if I burst. I got. Okay, I give well, you another well, minute. Yeah. In one minute, I apologize. I'm reading okay. Yehuda's message. Okay. In, okay. In, 2015, the United Nations created a paradigm shift. I'm using what you said. All countries con co committed to the 17 Sustainable Development Goal. But the question remains how do we can obtain the necessary funds? Here is the answer long term pension and insurance funds, including Social Security, are the perfect candidates. These funds need long-term investment, Yehuda says, to back up their commitments, to ensure the pensions of retirees, all of us in our kids. Essentially, one side, he says, creates long-term investment, and the other side sells premiums that cover the pension costs of people's retirement. A perfect match. However, the perfect match did not include the externalities that we are now need to take into account. Otherwise, the old paradigm that Frank is talking about changing will stay the same. It's the same machine. Therefore, the SDGs represent more than just an economical goal, he says. A dialogue with capital, capitalistic model cannot happen. It will only work if there is, if it will only work, says Professor Kahana, if there will be an approximation of new factors and metrics incorporated into the model that can translate the social benefits into monetary terms. That's a very important. I'm finishing by saying, we have no economic model that probably incorporates the social environment ideas, he says, therefore, the SDGs are most useful tool in the face of economic mode that solely think the economic bottom line into a whole new matrix. And the part, last point is the SDGs should become the business of governments. Then they should facilitate the approximate solution. And the last, and we cannot do it with models of change. We need Frank, we need transformation. It, it, transformation begins with, with where change end, a, a, ends. We have to transform our structure of thinking, and that's what the professor proposes. I'm sorry for interrupting. Thank Anna. you very much, uh, Tal. You finished one and a half minutes earlier, so you deserve to have this extra time. <laughs> okay, let's switch. Uh, to, uh, and then we will stick to uh, SDGs uh, goals. So he will, he is a physician, he is a famous uh, doctor and uh, uh, medical director of Diaconic Hospital in nearby Dresden in Germany. He's a uh, uh, World Academy uh, trustees and uh, he is a renaissance person he is writing about education about financing and uh, we are very pleased to have him today and he will be talking about innovative financial engineering to uh, to found uh, the sdgs and subtitle is the tao of finance okay hey it sounds very very attractive. Stefan, the floor is yours. And I put my timer. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep it shorter. So I will stay below the eight minutes. Okay. okay. So we have enough time to discuss. First of all, I would express um, my, my appreciation to my previous speakers because it was Frank Dixon with whom we've been discussing this topic over the last years, especially his ratio of the 20% and the 80% was actually very important for our approach. 
And second, I would ex also express my appreciation to Yehuda's work, whom I've met several times during the last years, and we've been exchanging ideas on his on the relevance of new risk assessments and governmental bonds and the role of the insurance company. The reason why I'm speaking here for the next seven minutes is that uh, in 2015, WAS started a working group, a working group, a fluid working group of about 30, 40, 50 people trying to answer the question Tal Ron had just mentioned, how can we finance SDGs, right? This was the big question we're trying to answer. We had about 40 to 50 conferences, panels, keynotes, background expert meetings all over the world. We're simply focusing on the question, how can we finance our future, right? And the question is so important because we didn't want to come up with an ideal, typical financial system, which will remain an academic theoretical proposition. But the answer was simply, what is the next best step to max out, to guarantee the possibility that we can finance the four to five trillion dollars necessary uh, for a common future. And there's just, I actually just want to show you one graph in order to make sure that we are on the same page. Just one graph. We try to come up with the following. If you look at the SDGs, we, we are talking about a framework of 12 to 15 years. We're not talking about a framework of 50 to 80 years, okay? Second, we're talking about um, a volume of three to four trillion US dollars every year additionally required to finance SDGs, okay? So that's the frame. If somebody has a different frame, we're talking about a different story. And we, you can look at this from a so-called stepped approach. And the first is about regulatory efforts. It's about harmonizing more transparency, more as, uh, ES, uh, social corporate responsibility, etc. The second step is about everything we know about modeling and taxation. Two Nobel Prizes has been given in order to come up with the strategy to finance SDGs, especially through CO2 taxes and reducing and adapting fees and subsidies. The third big factor is the so-called field of subs, um, impact funding. Roughly about a third of our SDGs are legible for the private sector. But then we found out two thirds are not. So we have to come up with the new strategy. The next step are so-called swap strategies. We are realizing that we need financial engineering that allow big investors, mainly institutional investors, big corporate investors, uh, treasury funds, big uh, sovereign funds to not only exit the fossil industry, but provide them a financial tool to swap their value into the green market. The fifth step is everything around private public uh, sector and private public private citizen partnership, which also includes the relevance of state bonds and funds. And then we came up, if you look at the data all together, you will sooner or later come up with the conclusion that if we take the entire discussion on financing SDGs together, including what Frank Dixon is saying and Yehuda is saying and others are saying, Nordhaus is saying, Jeffrey Sachs is saying, the amount of money required, four to five trillion, within 12 to 15 years will be not achievable. There is a gap missing. And this gap basically depends on the fact that we do not have a multilateral global consensus on the previous five steps. If we had a complete global consensus within the next three to four months, on regulation, taxation, impact funding, act swaps, and public-private partnership, 
We could do that within 12 to 15 years. The lower the multilateral political consensus is, the higher we have to come up with bold, out-of-the-box approaches to finance our common future. And then we looked into what's happening right now, like of POCs, proof of concept. And we found that central banks are experimenting already with so-called CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. We found out that the cryptocurrency market out there is highly capitalized, 350 to 400 billion every year, privatized. Yeah. And finally, we found that over the last decades, it's all the work of Bernard Lyotard showing we have a 50 year record of approved so-called regional currencies in place yeah. providing evidence that it would work. It would work to implement an additional parallel currency system, either top-down central bank or bottom-up private sector regional currencies to provide the financial gap and the financial uh, liquidity required to accomplish the 5 trillion within 15 years. And we actually can do that in less than 18 months. We are in contact now with the hidden champions on the planet in the corporate field who are doing digital financial retailing. And by presenting these ideas, they can tell us that they can implement such a system, whether top down or bottom up, corruption free, with distributive ledger technology and with a social contract enabling to finance SDGs invest on an investment level, on an intermediary level, and on a consumption level within less than 18 months. And there's already two or three pilot projects out there where the UN is supporting, for example, financing SDGs to blockchain technology to overcome poverty by providing basically individual transactions to people below the poverty line to transfer these digital monies on their cell phone, enabling them going shopping. And the same is true for the intermediary sector and the investment sector. And if we take that into account, we basically come up with the idea of the Tao of finance. And the Tao of finance simply says, we have a conventional system in place, which has its advantages, it has its goods, it has its benefits. But we need to think out of the box where linear, analytical, sequential, causal thinking comes to its end and to its limits. We have to start to think parallel. We have to start to think complementary. We have to start to think in a Taoist way of yin and yang. And this is why we call it the Tao Finance. If you're interested in reading more about it, please contact me. If you're interested to read an updated paper, uh, Gary Jacobs and me published a paper just last week at Katmus. If you need more information on data and where we are at that level with our project, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we saved uh, 40 seconds <laughs> of your time. Uh, okay. Uh, before we will uh, move to, uh, uh, to the next uh, part of our panel, I, I would like to remind that everybody will have opportunity to ask questions uh, after all uh, uh, presentations. But uh, it looks like we are moving to more and more concrete solutions. But if we have solutions, if we have new concepts, new theories, how we will deliver to business? So how we will teach them? And uh, now we have the three next presentations, um, great scholars 
school be talking about how peace, how to educate for sustainability, how to uh, edu create uh, transformative leadership. Okay, let's start, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, with you. Oh, you are drinking now. Well, let's move to uh, Sesio. <laughs> Okay, yes. I don't want to interrupt you. Sesh, are you ready? Yeah, because you are both talking about the... Okay, I don't... Uh, the, uh, unmute your speaker. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear, can you hear because me? Because you are talking about general ed management education. Then we will move to education for peace, what uh, Stephen will be talking, and then... Uh, we'll be talking about uh, education for transformative uh, leaders. Uh, okay, with, so uh, is everybody okay, able to hear me? The floor Can is you yours. hear me? Can, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. we hear you. Okay. Okay, so let me start a by giving you a very yeah, short can... introduction yes, to my I background, can... and which is what motivated me to even think about uh, the idea of where things need to start if we are going to transform the way we think and the way we are going to put solutions into place. So I have spent 30 years in the business world, ending with leading a corporation. I have taught courses in business schools and then for 15 years, I was involved, actually continuing even to today. I've been involved in future studies, rooted in a foundation for the future that was based in Bellevue, Washington. Okay. So given this background and looking at all of the things that have been described already by uh, Tal and uh, Frank and um, the third gentleman, Stefan, what I notice is that there, there is no shortage of solutions. There's no shortage of thinking. But where does this, where do you brainwash, if I can use the word, where do you start incorporating the idea that there is even a problem in the first place? It has to start with students who are studying business. I have taught business and I have talked to business school students in the MBA programs. Most of the time I ask them, what is your objective? Why are you studying business and finance? And most of the time they say, well, I want a good job and a big salary. They have no clue, basically, about what is happening outside of the environment in which they are studying whatever it is that they are studying, whether it is human resource management or financial analysis or how to look at things in terms of research and development and product design. But you say, wait a minute, you know, do you realize that whatever you are doing has resulted in a whole lot of issues that we have now discussed, what are described as externalities? Okay. They have no concept of the fact that in an indirect sense, when they go out into the world and operate at the corporate level, they have no idea that they are directly or indirectly responsible for the externalities that they have created. What have we heard so far? Externalities, dealing with externalities by way of solutions. Where should the thinking begin to approach and create a mindset that causes the development of uh, responsibility, accountability, leadership, and understanding the root causes? It has to start with management education. And I think it is sorely missing in the curricula of MBA programs throughout the world. There is no exception. Yes, they, they talk about social responsibility, but what does that social responsibility essentially mean? And I don't mean to trivialize it, but what they're basically talking about is to say, don't accept a pen from a supplier. They are not told about the ethics 
in, as it relates to the consequences that business is creating for future generations. They have no concept of even something so simple as what does the normal, the curve, the normal curve mean as to how you can understand phenomena. By way of saying the 2080 solution or the 10, 20, 90, or something that says, here is a standard deviation around a phenomena that can be normally under, you know, understood within the framework of a normal curve. Do they have any idea of how evolution works? We are told, we are brainwashed into thinking that the whole idea of human agency is all that is needed for solving problems, no matter how simple or how complex. But the real issue is, I personally think the fact that the, the notion that human agency is solely responsible for creating futures is highly overrated and wrong. What do we know about complexity? What do we know about chaos theory? What do we know about tipping points? What do we know about self-organization? Should these not be elements in the curricula for management education? Should they not be taught as to how things actually happen? All they are doing is repeating basically what is being told to them by saying, how do you look at a profit and loss statement and what does a balance sheet mean? But where all this needs to start is at the point where they are sitting in a classroom and understand the global implications of what businesses are doing and why because as has been pointed out already, we talk, we talk about globalization, but the simple fact of the matter is, Frank has made the point, Tal has made the point, so has Stefan, is economy and business has outstripped the notion of a nation state and its ability to solve anything. Not only has economy and business overridden the concept of the nation state, but also, it has caused change, profound changes in the cultural, the political, the social, the economic, and the religious systems of practically every country. I have a whole lot of slides here to show, but within the 10 minute time frame, I think it's, uh, it, I won't be able to do that. I'll be happy to share that uh, with everybody. And also the outlines of what I'm trying to describe I have laid out in an article that I have written long ago about management studies in the changing world. What needs to happen to curricula? Because I personally think that the preemption, even preemption in terms of, uh, I, I, I don't exactly know what the word is, but to introduce the notion of responsibility introduce the notion of accountability, introduce the notion of externalities as consequences, has to start with the fundamentals of business education at the university, at the colleges, wherever they are going. Now, what are some of these elements within coursework? In very general terms, I would say that they need to be taught about critical thinking. Most of the time, I have experienced students in the business schools who have no concept of distinguishing what it means to think properly. They are being told what to think, but they're not being told how to think. So you see constantly bias and prejudice and insufficient information and incorrect information being the basis on which decisions are made as they graduate from schools and become you know, uh, operants in, in, a, in the business environment. So the other aspect of this that I think incorporate, that needs to be incorporated in the curricula of business education, as I pointed out already is, how does evolution work? By evolution, I don't mean they don't need to understand, you know, or read origin of species and Darwin, but they need to understand what are the elements that create cultural evolution? How about the selection for fitness of what is described as memes, meaning ideas? How does that work? And uh, things like, uh, for instance, uh, I've pointed out, uh, I need to refer to my notes here, 
but I have three or four or five such things that I think should be offered not only as op uh, options within the frame, within the coursework, to expand their minds, expand their, uh, uh, the, the whole concept of how they approach the world when they get out of business schools. And we talked about the fact that fundamental changes need to be made to the operant paradigm. The operant paradigm of business as profit, business as shareholder value, business as capitalism or whatever it is, but not taking into account that these elements of financial analysis or elements of reorganization of social systems or whatever the solutions are requires a fundamental change to the operant paradigm itself. No system in the world as I know currently exists is able or willing to think seriously about going to ground zero and changing the very ideas and the values upon which we base economic activity. Sustainability is mentioned all the time, but what does this sustainability mean and how is it being implemented? Here is what I think it happened. It is a fraud. Sustainability and the talk about it is fraud because basically what they're saying is, do the same things that you have been doing for generations that have destroyed the planet, but do it carefully. That's not the solution. As we see now, the consequences that we are looking at, whether it is a pandemic, whether it is poverty, whether it is war, whether it is famine, whether it is climate change, whether it is the exhaustion of resources, whether it is the end of uh, fossil fuels, are business students being told about any of this? No, all they are being brainwashed into thinking is, go out into the world and do what you have always been doing, become a big vice president of a business without a clue as to what is happening around you. So my plea, as you can see my passion in this, is change the coursework, change the curriculum at a fundamental level within business schools. That's where you have to start. I will stop Thank there. I need to, anybody interested much. in a copy of my article or the slides that I have, I'll be happy to share with you. Yes, please share with us. And uh, we invite you to submit uh, article to Cadmus so we will popularize worldwide. I guess Thank as you, you uh, set the stage for uh, the next speakers and then particularly you raise the ethical issues and uh, positive externalities like uh, peace. And this no, is the topic uh, of the uh, next speaker. Vignier, something so simple as what is yeah. the true cost of a gallon of gasoline? Is <laughs> yeah, the business exactly. school is the yeah. business school teaching students? What is the actual cost or for instance, the fraud that is perpetuated in the stock markets? No. It's okay. Exactly. I know I was teaching at Carlson School and Humphrey students, so the mixture of public and business uh, students. It was very interesting how surprised uh, uh, they were at listening about externalities and lack of <laughs> internalization of uh, yes. externalities. So we need that was a, a beautiful word that Tal started with to say internalize the externalities, but start yeah. internalizing them in the business school. Yeah, exactly. No, it's excellent. I will send you my paper on sustainable business. You, you will see how far we agree together. Okay, let's move uh, the floor to Stephen Young. Yes. And what is very interesting that both uh, Sesh and uh, Stephen graduated from University of Minnesota, which I am also very much attached. Okay, Stephen, next okay. 10 minutes is for you. Right. Thank, thank you. And uh, let me use PowerPoint slide here. Uh, actually, uh, my university, Kyunghee University School of Management, have been uh, introducing this responsible management. Uh, and actually, we changed fundamentals or introductory management course into the new title of uh, fundamentals of responsible management. 
for the, for the last 10 years or so, I have been teaching this course. So uh, actually, I, I'm following uh, Mr. Vellamore's uh, uh, advice, I think. So today, let me focus on the topic today. And the topic that I would like to share with you all uh, today, it's uh, about peace, educating in, in the business school, educating and researching about peace. It's very important and, 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 and ultimate agenda for, for our uh, academic, uh, the, the business, uh, business education. So uh, let, let me follow the, the, uh, the PowerPoint slides here. So I would like to go over the, some of the importance of having this uh, agenda in, in our business education. And I would like to go over a little bit, maybe a couple of minutes about the, a Korea case, case from Korea uh, called the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Actually, we've been through like a roller coaster, you know, the days for the last couple of days, but I would like to touch upon this, uh, uh, the case and then uh, I will wrap up my uh, presentation, hopefully in, in 10 minutes. Okay, so peace, the, the, the subject peace may sound so, so grand, especially for the business, uh, business school or business education, but in my humble point of view, this is very ultimate mission of stakeholder management paradigm. And this is SDG number 16. And as you all know, uh, in the beginning of this, uh, this year, uh, the, uh, uh, the Davos Forum adopted this new statement of purpose of cooperation and, and new, the definition of new capitalism under the title of uh, stakeholder capitalism. So we are moving uh, toward uh, this direction and uh, of stakeholder capitalism and stakeholder management, responsible management, creating shared value. And this is the, the, the direction for the future business. So uh, in the end, it, 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 it's all of the taking care of the, uh, uh, the harmonious and the prosperous stakeholder environment, business ecosystem, it's all about building peace in the world. So I think this, ultimate, this, this peace issue, peace agenda, is very ultimate agenda of stakeholder management paradigm. And also business today, we globalize the world, will have more and more power, right? I, it could be either good or bad. And, and, and in, in this uh, globalized world, more and more business are exposed to the conflict zone. So peace issue is, is very relevant issue for them. Okay, and then, and then peace is good for business, right? On, especially under this stakeholder management paradigm, building peace is good for business. So it, it's about strate strategy strategy of making profit, right? So, so PC is a very important agenda. And also, like a Davos Forum this year, there, there, there arise some very drastically changing expectations from the public. And I see that through this kind of emergency, such as pandemic, then it will, it, it will speed up emergence of new paradigm. Okay, so uh, the, uh, again, I mean, the, the, this, uh, P, uh, the business, for peace is not very, you know, very frequently adopted idea, especially for the peace studies scholars. But I think gradually they start adopting the importance of business role in, in this topic, I guess. For example, uh, the uh, University of Notre Dame professor by the name Paul Laderesh, he once suggested that uh, peace, building, uh, peace building represents international confluence of improbable processes and people to sustain constructive change and reduces, reduces violence and increases the potential and practice of justice in human relationship. So improbable people and processes, right? And, and confluence of them. How can it make it happen? It's almost an impossible project. But when it comes to the magic of profit, when it comes to the magic of profit, actually, hopefully, in my point of view, that will happen between North and South Korea. So, so this is, this is new and this is very promising, especially again under the stakeholder paradigm. Okay, you know, peace studies, you know, famous Johan Galtung suggested that there are two kinds of peace, negative peace, positive peace. Negative peace is just the absence of violence. But positive peace is more fundamental, right? It is about building, providing optimal environment, human potential to flourish, harmonious environment, right? This is all about 
the stakeholder business ecosystem. So there is a uh, you know, famous uh, Institute for uh, Economics and Peace, which is a headquartered in Australia. They propose the eight pillars of positive peace, well-functioning government, equitable distribution resources, free flow of information, good relations with neighbors, high level of human capital, human capital, acceptance of rights of others, level of corruption, sound business environment. And except for the functioning of government, maybe it's related as well, but except, except for functioning of government, everything is so related, right? With the functioning of business, business operation. So again, this is you know very you know famous uh, diagram for uh, about the stakeholder management paradigm. It's very similar, right? It's very similar to uh, the the positive uh, peace pillars. So this is model I proposed. Actually, I published an article last year. So if I can follow traditional management system approach, input process output under the banner of stakeholder paradigm. Okay, it starts with the input, right? The paradigm of serving for society, companies will be benefit as well, benefit as well, making pro maximizing profit, right? So virtuous cycle of economic ecological system, this is the beginning, right? Belief system and conscious, and then companies will choose the, the, the product and service for society. They will not sell opium, just like in the case of Hong Kong, for example, and a strategic focus on social environmental sustainability, right? And, it, and process, the, the process of running business itself would contribute to peace, peaceful environment of the given society, right? Marketing, HR, finance, and so on, any given stra functional strategies under the uh, perspective of stakeholder uh, paradigm, it will serve for society and the company will make profit as well, right? So economic ecological system, sense of community, compliance management, and also maybe most importantly, public diplomacy, track to diplomacy. Through business, we can do something that government sector cannot do. And output, right? The stakeholder performance, you know, the economic development at first and social justice, environmental sustainability. This is all about building uh, positive peace. And also the uh, another point uh, which is strongly uh, made by the peace study scholars. Again, this is the model borrowed from that uh, University of Notre Dame professor, Paul Ladurash. He suggests that under the traditional peace studies, mainly led by you know, international you know, relations scholars and so on and so forth, political science, there are three gaps always arise. The first gap is about vertical gap. This is between top to bottom, right? Okay, we, we, we say that there is no nuclear weapon, right? But when it comes to reality, front, front line life, right? Livelihood, right? Peaceful, is it really peaceful at all, right? So this is a vertical gap. Justice gap, this is again, the gap between negative and positive, uh, the, uh, the peace, right? So, so justice in the society is kind of preventive level of peace, right? So unless you have that, unless you fulfill that gap, there will not be genuine peace. An interdependence gap. Peace, 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 it should be at the holistic level, not just about partial level, right? So it should address all the integrated ecological system. And how can we do that? And again, what I'm saying is uh, the business, uh, business paradigm under the banner of stakeholder management will greatly contribute to that. So in Korea, well, uh, I, I put the title here, Unfinished B4P Project. It started from 2003 under the different you know, administrations between South and North. But originally, it's a very good idea. You know, some 124 companies you know, the, uh, was hosted by this complex. This is uh, like a joint project between government and business and NGOs and so on and so forth. And also the international community. International community. So the Kaesong, Kaesong Industrial Complex, and Kaesong is located in right, uh, just right, you know, above the, the DMZ. So, so through this project, we, we, we were so hopeful that uh, we, we made this kind of, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the peaceful, you know, the, the impact, uh, impact on peace in the Kore uh, Korean Peninsula. So, uh, 
so uh, again, I mean, the, 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 this division of the North and Korea, uh, South, it, it is from the Korean War, and it, it was about 70, 70 years ago. But actually, it, it is uh, World War number three. You know, the 61 countries out of 93 actually participate in the war. So I think it would be so nice if we see some, 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 uh, some effectiveness of this B4P project uh, in, in the peninsula. So it is a peace project, economic project, and security project, and reunification project for us. So what about teaching and research again? I mean, uh, well, I can, I can talk about a lot of things in this agenda as well, but what the, Alfred Whitehead once said that fools act on imagination without knowledge, pedants act on knowledge without imagination. The task of university is to weld together imagination experience. So we need lots of creativity and we, lead, we need lots of solid dedication to this new way to go. So how can we do that? How can we, we, we can re genuinely adopt this kind of idea? Well, we need to change ourselves first, change, our, change how business sees itself, change how business education sees itself. And then we can make change, uh, we can make others change to see business or business schools as well. Thank, Thank you, you so Stephen. Much. That's it. Thank you very much uh, uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I just was very informal. I didn't mention that uh, Stephen is the professor of Kyungki University, very prominent uh, university uh, uh, in South Korea. He's also associate fellow. And I didn't pr present also, I mean, thanks uh, God that uh, Serge introduced himself, but he's also was, mm -hmm. we are very proud to have him as a, uh, World Academy Fellow. Um, then uh, now we have the, we understand the needs for significant changes in business education and to focus on, to change the paradigm, to focus on creating public goods, uh, positive externalities uh, like peace, like uh, clean environment, like social justice. But uh, particularly important is how to introduce the, the, the change. And this is why we need to have leaders. And uh, now this is the task for uh, Halit Kozer, who is the executive director of Global Community Engagement and the Resilient Fund. And he will be talking about smart investment for global leadership in preventing uh, violent extremism. We now see many countries, uh, some governments, some other organizations are taking advantage of the stress caused by COVID and moving toward uh, oppressive authoritarian uh, system. So, Halit, the floor is yours. Tell us how we can save the world from totalitarian uh, oppressive regimes. I, okay. I wish I could. Thank you very much. Um, I will be brief because I think we want to leave a few minutes for discussion with our audience. But I think it's all, also important to, to take the time just to say that I'm delighted to be part of this panel and to say that I hope that my fellow panelists and their families remain safe and well during this difficult uh, time. I'm very grateful to the UN and, of course, the World Academy of Art and Science for convening this tea conference. It's certainly a diverse panel and a diverse group of perspectives. I think that's what makes it interesting and kind of rewarding. Uh, I think I'll be speaking from a slightly different perspective from the other panelists so far. And let me just explain that. I am an academic by training, but in my current role, I lead a, a new international organization, as you've said, Chair, the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund. So my concern really is about overcoming very practical funding challenges that face development agencies like mine in the current context. And I guess maybe in contrast to the other speakers so far on this panel, I'm speaking from a more tactical than strategic perspective. But I also clearly see some commonalities be between what I'm speaking about, and I'll be saying a few words in a moment, and what others have spoken about. I think we all agree in one way or another that the current system is failing. I think we all agree in one way or another that we need new approaches that are holistic, that are smart, that are scalable, and that are complementary. 
And I think we all agree that the reason we're doing this is for a common future and a better world. So I think we have a, a similar goal, but I'm speaking perhaps from a slightly more narrow uh, perspective in this particular uh, context. From my perspective, leading a, a new development agency, one of the challenges for global leadership in the next few years, certainly, of the 21st century, will be how to achieve more with less. Uh, on the one hand, it's very clear to me that there are going to be fewer resources as global economic growth stalls, uh, as national GDPs shrink, and as overseas development budgets reduce. On the other hand, it seems to me that the challenges that we need to address not only remain, but in many cases are accelerating, whether climate change, poverty, or unemployment. So I think I'm speaking about the same challenge that many others have. How can we invest smartly? How can we make more use of the, the system, the financial system, the funds that are available? I want to focus on a very narrow topic, which is the concern of my organization, which is preventing violent extremism. And I want to try to illustrate how we at this organization are beginning to recalibrate our approach so that we can continue to do our work and perhaps even do more, even though there is less funding available. Let me quickly say a couple of words about COVID-19 and its impact on violent extremism and why we have this challenge. I think COVID-19 has impacted violent extremism in two main ways. Firstly, it is clear that around the world, extremists are instrumentalizing the pandemic uh, and government responses to the pandemic to promote their own world views. We see around the world that national and foreign governments are being blamed, and we see around the world that minority groups are being scapegoated. Secondly, at the same time, individual and community resilience to violent extremist agendas are reducing. More young people are spending more time at home and online. More people clearly are unemployed and are feeling they have no prospects. There's less opportunity to participate in religious, social and cultural activities where social cohesion is promoted. So on the one hand, we have an increasing risk of violent extremism. On the other hand, a decreasing resilience to uh, that risk. And at the same time, to make this almost the perfect storm, it's clear that funding for preventing violent extremism is reducing. Security budgets are focusing increasingly on counter-terrorism, on hard security responses. And that's because these have a more immediate impact than long-term prevention. Reduced budgets tend to demand quick results. Similarly, development budgets are shrinking in direct proportion to GDP, and foreign policy is also focused mainly on alleviating economic and health impacts. So rising violent extremism is a challenge with reduced funding. How can we respond to that challenge with reduced funding? How can we do more with uh, less? Um, it seems to me that the answer to that question is not simply to ask more. I think responsible leaders just need to recognize economic and political realities and, and pursuing a, an idealistic claim that we need more money for all of our, all of our interests and, and missions, I don't think is, is likely to be effective at the moment. Equally, I don't think the answer is to do less. Uh, we need to protect the investments that we have made and we need to maintain the trust of local communities going forward if we are to succeed. So rather than simply asking for more or doing less, these are four ways that we at GSERP are beginning to try to square this circle of how to do more uh, with less. Firstly, we're making the case very strongly that the national and the international are inseparable, are inextricably linked. Violent extremist agendas are transnational, and therefore investments in global efforts to reduce and prevent violent extremism are also an investment in national security. It seems to me in the current climate, national security is a trump card, and, and these are big priorities for governments, and if you can demonstrate that the work that you are doing is directly relevant to these priorities, that's one way to leverage further funding. Secondly, we have argued that development and security agencies, in fact, have shared goals. The best way to prevent violent extremism is to invest in the future of individuals and communities. That's development inputs for security outcomes. So preventing violent extremism is one example of many focus areas where pooled funding between different government departments can have wider benefits and can achieve both those departments' goals. Thirdly, I think it's important to note that investing, investing in communities can generate resilience not just to violent extremism, uh, but also to other pandemics and other external shocks as well. The key here is to invest in communities and not separate out the reasons why we are doing it. Focus on investing in communities 
break down the different silos where different agencies invest in different communities for different reasons. Let's just focus on community resilience writ at large. And finally, and here I echo some of the sentiments of the earlier panelists, we believe there is a complementary role around preventing violent extremism, as well as many other development uh, perspectives for public-private partnerships. Uh, now more than ever, it seems to us, companies need to protect their investments and protect their customer base. And violent extremism is a clear threat to both. All too often, and we've heard this in Davos and many other settings, development actors have tended to view the private sector simply as access to further funding for their own goals. That's wrong. It seems to us that public-private partnerships should be based on co-creation and based on common goals. So the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, the agency that I lead at the moment, is employing all of these strategies to maintain the donor base that we need to continue to support local communities. We're also, by the way, adjusting the way that we ourselves invest in local communities, whether it's lowering the barriers to access, repurposing grants towards the COVID-19 response, or digitizing activities. In conclusion, it seems to me that demonstrating purpose to new priorities, pooling funding, reducing silos, and creative partnerships are all ways that global leaders can promote smart investment to meet their challenges of the 21st century. Thank you, Chair. Your mic, speaking. I think you're muted, Chair. Thank you very much, Harit. Uh, yeah, I guess now we, uh, you saved uh, one minute plus, uh, have more, even two minutes. Uh, uh, and then we can move to the questions and answers. Uh, before we will, I see uh, Sesh, uh, yeah, we can uh, exchange. One, I need one extra one minute to kind okay. of wrap things up, yeah. See. Okay, please uh, do this, Sesh. Yeah, okay, so we were talking about externalities and a lot of ideas put forward by way of metrics. May I suggest two very important sources. One is the work of Professor Norman Myers from Oxford in the UK, who talks about GDP. As it stands now, all of the negative externalities that we have created are added to GDP. He has done a lot of work saying, should they be subtracted from GDP to get a true picture of what is happening by way of economic development and the measurement of progress as GDP. For instance, the denuding of the Amazon rainforests is a negative. The creation of criminal justice systems is a reaction to something negative or medical systems for pandemics and or heart disease or obesity. These are all things that are added to GDP by way of a monetary exchange because of the activities, but should they be subtracted? The second, and he has found doing this for the 25 year period some time ago, is that global GDPs have actually declined if you do a true measurement of GDP. The second thing is Hazel Henderson has done a tremendous amount of work on the metrics of global well-being. How do you go about getting to the idea of global well-being? And finally, I just want to quote a famous scientist, Edward O. Wilson, who has written a book called Consilience, and here is what he has to say. During the past 30 years, the ideal of the unity of learning, which the Renaissance and Enlightenment bequeathed us, has been largely abandoned. With rare exceptions, American universities and colleges have dissolved their curriculum into a slurry of minor discipline and specialized courses. I cannot agree more with you, Sesh. I mean, I'm working 30 years at American universities and now doing work in Poland or in Europe, you know, or see that fragmentations. This is what I'm missing, you know. I mean, we had the lunch meeting, we were meeting engineers with uh, medical professors 
um, the other social sciences. And then it was an opportunity to, to exchange ideas, you know. This, yep. is, this is how the peacemaker was invented in Minnesota, you know, just the engineers had the meetings, I mean, the lunch meeting with the medical doctors. Yes. So this is this is something what we should uh, overcome. I mean, uh, that we have a lot of work, structural work in academia. So I'm glad that uh, that uh, uh, we we watch this issue. Uh, one of the comments I got in the chat uh, was that we should talk about education from preschool, you know, to start to introduce the holistic picture. And yes. step by step, you know, teach them uh, about the all interconnectivity what we, we have and then the responsibility, the freedom and the responsibility. So you are a great panelist. I would like to invite all of you to our project. Uh, we were talking uh, yesterday, we had an excellent session about master degree program for global transformative leadership. And this is the place we would like to put all these nice ideas. I got uh, suggestions from uh, uh, our attendants. I mean, we need to develop the new theory of firm, you know. I mean, uh, we, we, uh, Yehuda was talking about new economy, you know, how to uh, include social and environmental issues, uh, investing in, so we have, a lot of new ideas and we would like to work on this um, during next month or so and present more uh, integrated project maybe during our October uh, conference in uh, Geneva. But also this is a work in progress and uh, I will send you information uh, about this because you your contributions will be very, very important. I see, for instance, all these uh, first uh, panelists to contribute to the, the advanced courses and uh, the, all of you, I mean, the, the, the methodology, the, the, the curricula, I mean, you have excellent Sash uh, and uh, Stephen and Halit, you know, uh, contribution to the content of the courses, how we should teach. And then we would like really to have new way of education, particularly for the leaders in business and public and non-profit sectors. Okay, the floor is open. Any questions from the panelists, from each other? Unfortunately, Stefan had to leave us because he had some other assignments. And I wanna... Tal, I see. Your, yeah, 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 you can raise hand and I will uh, give you the floor. Okay, Tal. Yes, thank you very much. I, I just want to make go, sure go that ahead. we... Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, okay fantastic. I wanted to uh, cocktail on the notion of the what we need is a transformation, is transform, transformation on the level of nation states. We've been thinking from change models. You know, the change model that brought us the world to today, as Frank mentioned, the change models created problems we cannot solve in the same structure. We've brought them together, as our friend Einstein said, you know, and we need to think about transformation. And I keep hearing us speaking about transformation is a, another way of saying to, to change. Change is a content shift. Transformation is a context shift. And I think the structural thinking that this team of people wanna bring about is how do we transform a nation of people in, in a, at least as fast as the nation where you are transformed its behavior when the coronavirus came in. South Korea, Israel, the United States, the, the rate in which we transformed from one day into another is the scale of shifts I think we need to start getting ready for on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Tal. Thank you. 
any other questions, comments from the panelists? I got the yes. message that we can extend uh, our session uh, for the uh, next uh, 20 or 30 minutes if we need, you know. Uh, okay, go ahead. Who would like to? Uh, Frank, go ahead, unmute your. Okay. I just wanted to um, build on uh, the great points made by Stephen and Halid uh, about peace. Um, uh, and 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 kind of just um, talk that made me think about the U.S. strategy around that and terrorism and in the you know that you could have a, a supply side strategy or a demand side strategy in the in the U.S. Our focus is mostly on the supply side by suppressing terrorism uh, with um, military and police force, but the most effective strategy would be a demand side strategy. And I think that's what Stephen and Halid were talking about. The number one, probably the, the root cause of terrorism, at least against the US, is the extensive negative impacts that our companies and government have in other countries. We, through our systems that compel companies to put profits ahead of everything else, we wind up unintentionally degrading their life support systems, their culture, their there are communi communities and, and many things. And this leads to legitimate grievances against the US, a desire to hurt us because we hurt them. The number one strategy to protect our country and, and the much more effective and less expensive strategy and morally appropriate strategy is to focus on the demand side. In other words, stop the negative impacts that are compelling other companies to, to want to hurt us by helping building up communities, as you said, Halid, and helping business to understand that the peace benefits them, as, as you said, Stephen. So in, in the US, often our kind of media deceives people into thinking that terrorism exists because other countries are jealous of us and that, you know, because we're doing better or something, that's why, why they want to hurt us. That, of course, is ridiculous. The, they want to hurt us because we've hurt them. So stop hurting them and they'll stop wanting to hurt us. That's the obvious solution, I think. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I took part, I mean, observing the, uh, the previous session uh, on the global governance. And uh, one of the postulates was, we need to get out of these national borders, which imposed on our thinking. We need to do, and it's coming out also from our discussion, we need to start building and much faster than ever global community, regional, global community, move beyond national borders because otherwise we will be in big troubles. And then type of national way of thinking creates on the conflict. So we need to overcome and move forward. Sesh? Yeah, two comments on what Frank said and what Tal, the question Tal raised. I think the approaches have to be simultaneous. One is mitigation, basically react, which is what we are all talking about doing. And the second thing is preemption. Now, when it comes to preemption, it requires a fundamental change in the paradigm that we are yep. using. It starts with, you said, we have to go beyond the nation state. What does that mean? It means it's a question of identity. Who are you? Yeah. Children need to be taught exactly. who they are, not, you know, they, uh, we are capable of assuming multiple identities depending on the need. But now the question is, can we go beyond the nation state and think in terms of being a citizen of the planet? One, two, the value of interdependence, the value of the fact that we are interdependent on each other, also, the fact that nature and man are not enemies, yeah. that they have to be exploited and conquered, that we are part and parcel. 99.99% .99 of all that ever existed is extinct. We are not yeah. exempt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sesh. Any other comments or questions uh, from panelists and from the audience? And yeah. they issues you would like to raise i can go ahead anybody okay yeah. so okay it, Tal. yeah Tal, last remark take the floor. yes la yeah thank you seth i want a cocktail on what you said you know in our 
the only place when such a transformation happened to a global centric point of view was when the astronauts looked at the outside of the planet. Mm -hmm. I think that we're, if we want to move from an egocentric society to an eth ethnocentric period of time on the planet to a global centric view, we need to embrace the global view methods from the astronauts. Uh, in every work, when we yeah. presented for people their self as blue planet, and I think to the degree that we are able to uh, to minimize the planet and to maximize the awareness of the planet for people on the planet, then we can right. expedite the global transformation. I have a, a two-minute video that every child should be asked to watch. It's called The Pale Blue Dot by Carl mm -hmm. Sagan. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Stephen, take the floor. Unmute yourself, Stephen. Okay. Still unmute yourself. Oh, hello? Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So one thing that I would like to add to Frank's, co Frank's comment is that uh, I think it's, uh, it's very important to note the new generation. Oftentimes, uh, people call them as Generation Z, right? And mm -hmm. if you take a look at this, uh, you know, unfortunate protest uh, movement in the United States, well, well, it, yes. surprisingly, I can see that in Seoul, Korea, and actually, these young minds, these young people, they are so empathized with all this very fundamental human rights issue. So. The, the, this new generation is very special generation and they are very sensitive to what is right and they are very advocate for what is right. So I think uh, for that said, I think it's very promising. So, so for our generation, <laughs> the only generation, we need to provide some good platform for them to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, to raise that issue. This additional argument that we need to uh, work together on new curricula, on new paradigm uh, 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 in management, in economics, in uh, social sciences we are teaching, uh, more integrative and uh, oriented of complexity and holistic. So this is something what is uh, very, very important for us. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to, for you to, if you have any presentation, would like to submit, we will post on our sites. And I strongly invite you to, to present, I mean, to write your articles, uh, our uh, World Academy of Arts and Sciences publications are ready for you. And my, uh, Special thanks to all of you in uh, in the uh, or chron chronological order. Tal, thank you, and Frank, and Stefan is gone, but uh, then Sesh, uh, Stephen, and Holly. My special thanks to my friend uh, Yehuda Kahane, who spent months to write this excellent uh, article. Yehuda. We highly appreciate you. We love you. You are a wonderful man and you help us to change the world. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much and stay Thank in touch. You. Working together for the common good. Okay. I will, I will send my slides and the article to WAS admin and they can circulate to everybody. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Sesh. And Thank you, you know, we meet uh, in Bellevue because I, I have my American residence is in Bellevue. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> anytime you are, anytime you are visiting, <laughs> let me know. When you are coming okay. here, let, let me know. Yeah. I am okay. stuck in Europe now. Yes. 